weekend at Exalt Church, our fifth Easter. Can you believe that? Isn't it awesome? So glad to have you guys here. And what a week it's been. We had communion on Thursday night, and what a beautiful time at the Greenbrier Country Club. If you missed it, guys, you missed it. It was fantastic. So we'll invite you next year. And then we had our first annual crosswalk on Friday, where we carried a cross for about a mile down Greenbrier. And what an exciting event. So many stories of people talking about how when they carried the cross of Christ on their shoulder, how it impacted them as they remembered what Jesus Christ did for them. Now, I want to point something out to you today. Our lights behind me are not working on the stage. However, isn't it apropos that the lights on the cross are working as that is our sole focus today. Amen. Jesus Christ and the cross. And so what a a beautiful picture there. Now, normally uh, when I teach on a Sunday morning, I give you all kinds of life application to apply to your life. And, And I do believe that today's message will apply to you on a on a more of a macro level than a micro level, but I notice I didn't give you any notes to follow along with today. And the reason for that is I, I want to speak past your mind today, and I, I want to speak directly to your heart. And I don't want this to be an intellectual exercise. I don't want this to be leave here and what do I do exercise, but I want to give space for Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit in the next few minutes as I talk to you to penetrate your heart as I share with you the whole Easter story. I might also call this the Bible in four words. And we're going to bring the graph up here right now. I want you to see this. Here is the Bible story in four words. Here is the Easter story in four words. It began with creation. When God said, let there be, and God created a beautiful heavens and a beautiful earth, It had no sin, it had no death, it had no pollution, had no war, had no family drama. Wouldn't it be great to have a have a holiday without any family drama? Oh, you guys are shouting me down right now. God looked and God said it's good over again. Good, good, good. Looked at woman and he said, very good. Creation is good. God made this earth perfect. God made creation perfect. And the problem is today, you and I have experienced the fall. And so we see everything through the filter of sin. Think about it. When Jesus was upon the earth, Jesus was perfect. And he did not see anything through the filter of sin. But you and I, we were born into sin because of the fall. And we see people through the filter of sin. We see marriages through the filter of sin. We see parenting through the filter of sin. We try to govern nations through the filter of sin. We try to do businesses through the filter of sin. We try to have a church community where we love one another, and yet we all see each other through this filter of sin. Because when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit and they fell into sin. Sin became this parasite that touched everything in God's good creation. So husband and wife were perfect. Now their relationship was fractured by sin. The the environment was perfect. Now it's changed by sin. Relationship with man and God was perfect. And now this fall, this sin now separates God from man to God to where he used to trust man, used to trust God and pray to God is now suspicious of God. And now instead of worshiping the only true God, man's heart has changed and it's become hardened. But not only has it become hardened, but man's heart has now become a an idol factory where now it makes gods and creates gods for itself to worship. The heart that was once fully in line with God and loved God is now fallen and now it creates all of these idols. And and what happened in the fall? Sin came into the earth. Sickness came into the earth. And I want to say this again. Sin is not just something that you do. Sin is an entity that is a parasite and an invader that has attached itself to everything good in God's creation. That's why we die this week. 
I had the privilege of driving to St. Louis on Sunday just in the moments before Laura's aunt passed away. I got to be at her, uh, her, her foot side as she slipped from this world into the next world and to be there and to celebrate her faith, but also to be disgusted at the fact that death ripped and stole another loved one. And I don't know about you, if you've ever sat through one of my funerals, I, I don't try to make death beautiful. We all try to make death beautiful, and so we use words like, they passed away. Oh, they went to a better place. We put flowers around the funeral home. Look, everything else is dead and dying in your lawn in the winter. You go by a funeral home, there's flowers everywhere. Why? Because we try to soften this blow. Death was never the plan. And so when the fall happened, if you think about this for a moment, death happened, it became this. The world became the way it was not supposed to be. Husband and wife were never supposed to die. They were never supposed to end the relationship. It was to be an eternal relationship forever. You were never supposed to bury a child. You were never supposed to bury a parent. You were never supposed to bury a husband. You were created with eternity in your heart. That's why as you go past the age of 50, not that I've been there yet, but you get to that point and what? You still feel like an 18-year-old inside. Your body is a little slower and the workout hurts a little more. But inside, I feel like I'm 18. Why? Because God has put eternity in every single one of you. You were created to live forever and live in relationship forever. And yet death came. Sin came. War came. Pollution came. Division came. And we see a quick spiral from chapter 3 in Genesis to where now brother kills his brother. And we see all kinds of evilness throughout Genesis as this perfect garden began to spiral out of control into the abyss. And now look, our world is full of division. And right now we're on the brink of perhaps another great war and the pandemic that stole two years from our lives and on and on we say, and we look at it and we all know it's true because when a mother buries a child, you say, God, this is wrong. This is not the way it's supposed to be. As you kiss that loved one for the last time in the casket and you kiss their cold body, at that moment, you know in your heart, this is wrong. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Creation was good. Fall destroyed everything. And then the story of redemption God comes, born as a baby. And he comes and he lives the perfect life. We find him at the grave of his friend Lazarus. And the Bible says that Jesus wept, he cried. And in the Greek language there, it basically talks about he was snorting. If you can picture a horse in full run into warfare, into battle, snorting as it's trotting, going. That is the word there. He is snorting and he's crying at the grave of his friend Lazarus. Why? Because Jesus himself, the author of life, the creator of life is saying, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I didn't create my friends and my people to die. And Jesus comes and he lives the perfect life without sin. And look what happens in the garden. Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden was replaced by Jesus Christ's obedience in the Garden of Olives. Adam and Eve hid behind a, a tree, naked and covered in shame. And yet Jesus Christ hangs upon a cross, fully naked. Your pictures that you see drawn don't give it justice. He was fully naked. And upon the cross, Jesus conquers our shame. Adam and Eve are in paradise, and they're forced out because of the curse of their sin. While Jesus, outside the city gates, dies upon a cross and ends up in paradise because of the cross. Think about that. His perfect sacrifice. Adam and Eve's sin ushered in the curse of thorns into our world. Upon the cross, Jesus wears a crown of thorns. 
ushering in salvation from sin. Why was such a bad Friday for God? Why was such a bad Friday for Jesus? Do we call it Good Friday? Because it was the reverse of the curse. And because he died in my place as my substitute, as your substitute, you now have access to God. Now, most people want to stop there. And they want to say, yeah, Jesus saves us and is going to, you know, make us get out of this earth and escape this earth. No, that's not the whole story. The whole story is look at the last chapter of Revelation. Restoration is coming to where God is going to cleanse this old world order and strip sin completely from his renewed heavens and his renewed earth where there will be no death, there will be no disease, there will be no war. We sometimes call it the new earth and the new heaven. I, I think a more accurate translation of that Greek word is a renewed earth and a renewed heaven where God ultimately and forever defeats the power of sin and death forever. Can you say yes to that? That one day you will walk in a renewed earth without the filter of sin on your eyes. Think about it for a moment. Being able to see things the way Jesus sees. To see others the way Jesus sees them. In a perfect renewed heaven. A perfect renew earth. Let me get into the scripture here for just a moment. And I know it's, I unpacked there an entire series right there that we could do. And someday I may come back and do an entire series on those four points. I've been wanting to do that for five years, but I've been wanting to try to grow you up and mature a little bit before I take you there because when I go there, I'm going to blow some of your minds. I know that. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read through a short passage and then I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts and then I'm going to uh, close out the service. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14, it's on the screen. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. If Jesus didn't die, we're just a country club. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify, testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. Let me stop there for a moment. Jesus didn't come to be an add-on to your life, to just give you a good life. He didn't come to make you a good person. He came to make you a new person. He didn't come to be an add-on to your life. Let me add a little Jesus to my life. Let me add a little Jesus to my religion. Jesus came to be your entire life. And if we have only a little bit of behavior modification, if all that Exalt Church has taught you is how to be a good husband, and we dealt six weeks with, with marriage last week, but that's all we've done, we're to be most pitied and most miserable if all we got was some value in this earth. And all you learn from Pastor Rodder and Exalt Church is, is how to be a good financial steward. I, I have failed in my role as your pastor. He says, listen, if Christ has not been risen from the dead. And if we have only Christ for hope in this life, we're to be pitied. But verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits. Look at someone next to you and say first fruits. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made of life. But each in his own order. Christ, there's that word again, the first fruits. Look at your neighbor and say first fruits. Verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. At his coming. Verse 24, after his coming, then comes the end 
when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, I read to you from the Apostle Paul. Some of you are thinking, man, that Apostle Paul, he uses a lot of words. Yes, he does. In fact, the Apostle Peter says that Paul talks so much, he's hard to understand sometimes. And some of you, as I was going through some of these points, you're kind of thinking, what is Paul saying? It's Easter. I gave you the Bible in four words. But I want to give you one more word, and I want you to take it with you. This word, first fruits. It says that Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Look at this picture on the screen. I was raised in Kansas where we had a lot more worse winters than we have here in moderate Hampton Roads. It was cold. It was bitter. It wasn't Colorado. So you couldn't do anything outside. You couldn't ski. We were too lazy to try to do cross-country skiing because it's flat. And the snow would come, and sometimes it would come as late as February and March. I talked to the folks recently. They even had snow in April this year. Snow. Talk about sin in the fall. But I would walk into my parents' backyard, and you see on the screen here, right about March, something would happen. The tulips would begin to pop up out of the ground. And I love this picture because it looks like hands are being raised coming out of the ground. And as the tulip pops up, what is that tulip? It is the first fruits of something greater coming. And what the tulip says is, it's cold, it's bitter, it's winter, you're freezing, but spring is coming. It's not the way it's supposed to be, but this lone tulip is a signal to say, more is coming, and life is coming, and spring is coming, and winter will not win. That one tulip was the first fruit of something more magnificent and something even more greater, life returning from the cold winter. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. His bodily resurrection was a sign to this fallen world that says, I am coming through winter and spring is coming and the death that stole your loved ones and the sickness that took your family too soon and the war and the pestilence and the disease and the brokenness and the drama of this world, it will not win forever. It cannot stand. I am trying not to preach on Easter, but I'm going to go ahead and do it, all right? I'm trying to stay in my lane, but it's kind of hard after Tony led us in that worship today. He rises from the dead, and he says, at my coming, you're going to rise too. Your world may be cold right now. Your world may be in this freezing place right now. Your heart may be cold and you may have lost all hope. But on this Easter Sunday, as you're going through maybe a divorce and you have no hope and maybe you are separated from your children where your teenage son chose her over you and won't talk to you, whatever it is, the resurrection gives us a hope in this life and the world to come that it's not going to be this way forever. 
the spring is coming. Show you another picture right here. I was sitting in my office in Florida a number of years ago. And I looked out the window while I was looking at my sermon notes before I preached the next morning. And I looked out and it was dark and I saw this one light in the parking lot. This is not that parking lot. This is just to represent that parking lot. And when I looked at that parking lot, I saw a light. And what did I see in the light of that parking lot light? I saw hope in the darkness, in the blackness, in the overwhelming bleakness of that evening. I saw a single light shining, standing there, proclaiming, it may be dark, but I stand here as a first fruit. I stand here in the midst of the blackness saying to the darkness as a testimony, darkness, you will not win. Sin, you will not win. Death, you will not win. I may stand here alone at this moment, but I proclaim to you in this darkness, dawn is coming. Jesus Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection. It's an agricultural term. But we're in the city, we don't get agriculture. So I could talk to you about wheat all day long and you'd be like, okay, Kansas kid, go home. But you understand how cold winter is. You understand what a moonless night is like and how dark it is. In the midst of that darkest hour, Jesus was that light of the world, that first fruit of the resurrection, who came out of the grave and in the winter and the darkness, he proclaimed, darkness you will not win. Darkness, you will not prevail. The brokenness of sin, this parasite that has attached itself and destroyed relationships and destroyed lives and destroyed governments and destroyed all kinds of things. You will give up and you will surrender because I'm coming again. And at my coming, everything that has been laid bare and everything that has looked like it's not supposed to be, I'm going to set it right. And those that have been buried and dead, like Jesus Christ, you too, will rise from the dead into a new dawn. Amen? Can you see this this morning? I want you to get the picture. What do we do with this? Have hope. That in the midst of your lament, it's okay to lament. It's okay to watch the television set and when you and limit your, your news intake, but when you watch it and you see all of the brokenness, it's okay to say, God, this isn't right. And hear the voice of the Holy Spirit agree with you and say, Daughter, it's not right. It's okay to grieve at the grave of that loved one and say she died too young. He was a good soldier and he went to sue. And say it's not right. It's okay to say that you've served God and you love God and you married forever and she walked out and it wasn't even a part of what you wanted. You did not want her to walk out, but she walked out and you pursued and she still walked out and you say, it's not right. You hear the voice of the Holy Spirit say, you're right, child. It's not right. 
but the winter will not win. And the darkness will not prevail. Because there was one named Jesus Christ who came. Died a death he did not deserve to die. Upon a cross that wasn't his cross to bear. Lived the perfect life in my place. And the world rejected the light of God and the Son of God. And upon a cross they killed him and crucified him. But because of his perfect sacrifice... God the Father said, come forth, my anointed one, come alive. And Jesus came out of that grave. Amen. Amen. The whole story of Easter is simply this. God created it and said it was good. Sin marred it and destroyed it. Jesus came and redeemed it. Let me pause there for a moment. When we started Exalt Church, Laura and I wanted to name it ReChurch. We tested the name and everyone thought we were being proud, saying that we were going to do church the most perfect way. And you know, we don't have a clue what we're doing around here. Amen. But why ReChurch? Because Laura and my favorite word in our home is this word, redeem it. Redeem it. We love to adopt old dogs that nobody else wants or in their last days and years and bring them in. We've got one right now that's peeing everywhere in our house. Yep. And we're loving that thing, redeem this last few weeks or months, however it's going to be. Give it a good life. We like to redeem things. We've taken houses that we bought and we've restored them and made them rentals and then sold them later on. We've, we're going through a project in our house right now that for six months... All the broken pipe in our house has been replaced. And for six months, we've had holes all over our ceiling throughout Christmas. And Laura said, let's just not have it be worked on the week of Easter. And guess what's happening right now? They're repairing it during the week of Easter. And our phrase is, redeem it. Redeem it. God, redeem it. We come in a situation where there's a bad situation. As a pastor, I am honored to hear your stories and I feel your stories and I carry them on my shoulders and I feel the weight of them. I, I wish I could take your story sometimes and just throw it over my shoulder and not feel it, but I feel it in my heart. And oftentimes my prayer for you is, God, redeem it. Redeem that marriage, redeem that relationship, redeem that situation, redeem it. Re, restore it, redeem it, renew it, revive it, revitalize it, resurrect it. Creation, fall, redemption, and ultimate restoration. Amen. Will you stand with me in the name of Jesus? I want to pray for you. Father, in a crowd like this, we have folks that um, are here and we don't know all of their stories. But God, I know some have no hope. I know some that are in a broken place and some have given up and, and some here right now feel like the darkness has become so dark that they can't see their hands in front of their face. God, some of them, their lives have become so cold that they feel like they can't go on because they are frigid and they're cold. Some are walking through difficult situations right now that their education did not prepare them for, that their therapist can't help them through, that the doctor can't solve. God, some this year have said goodbye to loved ones and the sting of that is so real this morning. And they say it's, not, it's too much. Today, Father, would you bring forth in this Easter moment awaken hope in their hearts to realize that the Jesus who rose from the dead as the first fruits declares that the winter will not win and the darkness will not prevail. 
And Lord, may they be like those tulips themselves. And may they be like that light in the dark parking lot. As new creations in Christ. Being the light of the world. Being the salt of the world. Proclaiming along you, Jesus Christ. That you have won. And final victory has been declared. And the reality of that will be revealed in your time. Now, Lord, you say a day in your time calendar is like a thousand years in my calendar. And I want to be quite honest, I don't like that very much. I think you're slow sometimes. But I also know having served you for so many years, your timing is perfect. Your timing is right, and you waste nothing. Would you redeem our situations? Would you cause good to come out of the bad? Would you conform us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ? We know you waste nothing. Don't waste this winter season. Don't waste this dark night. But shine forth your hope. Shine forth your salvation. Break shame and sin and patterns in our lives that have held us down. Set us free from addictions, Lord, I pray. Restore marriages and relationships this Easter season. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. Did you receive something this morning? Are you glad you came this Easter? Come on. All right, church. Once again, it is awesome to see you all this morning. I encourage, invite your friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors, people you see in school. Invite them out next week to Exalt Church. We'd love to see them here. We're about to take up our offering. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. If you are a first-time guest, as I had mentioned earlier in the service, you're going to turn in your Connect cards with the offering as it goes around. If you're a first-time guest, we ask you not to give anything. Allow this service to be our gift to you. Why do we give? At Exalt Church, we see cheerful giving as an act of worship. It's an act of worship, guys, in response to the generosity that God has given us. While we do not overemphasize money and giving, we do encourage giving as we partner in what God is doing. And we thank you for your giving as you partner with Exalt Church. I'm going to ask the ushers to go while they're collect, uh, sending uh, out the offering. I said, everybody stay still. This is a solemn time, um, and, and it's an important time. So they're going to take up the offering. Um, did you guys get something this morning? I know I did. I know you guys look fantastic, and we can't thank you enough for joining us online this morning. If you guys did not come prepared to give, you can also give online. You can text to give, and there's a kiosk in the lobby. So if you prepare to give, you can drop it in there or your Connect cards. If you're online and part of our online campus, you can go to exaltchurch.com. Regardless of how you give, thank you for partnering with Exalt Church. And guys, thank you for joining us this morning. A happy Easter to you guys. See you next week. God bless you all.